Uh, welcome to our Women in Philanthropy program as part of our spring business meeting. As you know, Women in Philanthropy really enjoy exposing our members to the many different areas of UCLA, some of which we may not be aware of or even know exist at the university on the campus or within UCLA. And today, one of those entities is one we're gonna be hearing about, the UCLA Film and Television Archive. It had been housed in the School of Theater, Film and Television, but was moved over to the UCLA Library Division in 2019 to better integrate it, it for teaching and learning and expanding access through the library's robust digital platforms. The uh, program was initially established, sorry, initially established in 1965. It's the world's largest university held collection and the second largest repository of motion pictures and broadcast programming in the United States after the Library of Congress. So pretty impressive and pretty big and broad. The UCLA Film and Television Archive is renowned for its pioneering efforts to rescue, preserve, and showcase moving image media and is dedicated to ensuring that the collective visual memory of our time is explored and enjoyed for generations to come. Today, we'll hear from Mei Hung Hadong, the new director of the UCLA Film and Television Archive. Mei will discuss the Moving Image Library's efforts to restore, preserve, collect, research, and educate. And she will also address her goals for the program for the future. May came to UCLA from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, where she was senior manager of public access and served as a principal re representative for the Academy's film archive. Before then, she was served, before she served at the uh, Academy Film Archive, she was the project manager for the Outfest UCLA Legacy Project for LGBTQ Moving Image Preservation, a collaboration between the UCLA Film and Television Archive and Outfest, which produces the Los Angeles LGBTQ Film Festival. May currently serves on the Legacy Projects Advisory Committee and on the Board of Directors of the One Archives Foundation. May earned her master's degree in moving image archive studies from UCLA in 2006 and her bachelor's degree in cinema and media studies from Wellesley College in the year 2000. We have time allotted after her presentation for questions. So please submit them using the chat function that's at the bottom of your screen. The questions will be reviewed and consolidated by Melissa and I will pose them to May. So now I will turn it over to um, May. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Susan, for having me. Um, it's really an honor to, to join all of you and to share the important work taking place at the UCLA Film and Television Archive. I want to say hi to Kat Kramer, who mentions that her um, father's collection is at the UCLA Library and the Archive. Thank you so much um, uh, for that. And we're excited to always be stewards for this important collection. So. Um, welcome and um, thank you for having me. Um, so before I start as a land grant institution, it's important for UCLA to acknowledge the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. We're humbled to do work in this community. So first, let me tell you about a little bit about myself. 
Um, as Susan mentions, I'm, I'm returning to UCLA um, as, as the new director, but I have a strong foundational home at UCLA and have had um, since graduating some years ago. Um, here, I found an environment that fostered a space for learning, curiosity, and growth. Um, and after graduating from UCLA some years ago, um, I did serve as a project manager and also eventually um, worked at the Academy Film Archive where I oversaw access uh, to the archives collection for 13 years. Um, so uh, a little bit about um, where we're at. So a new home. So returning to UCLA has been really a lifelong dream and I'm thrilled to join a talented group of experts and practitioners. Um, I want to thank the entire staff of the archive um, who are not here, but are here in spirit, who bring their passion, ingenuity, and deep knowledge and commitment to this work. Um, their warm welcome has, has truly meant so much to me. So, um, and a new home has many meanings. As Susan mentioned, um, in October of 2019, the archive founded uh, found a new institutional home at the UCLA Library. We're excited to align this tremendous repository of motion picture and broadcast programming in the US with the library's world-class archival and scholarly collections. Our librarians help faculty and students use our collections every day, and we're leveraging this expertise to better, better integrate the archive's incredibly rich holdings in teaching and learning. I want to say as a, as a graduate student, I actually received a fellowship to allow me to attend um, the Moving Image Archive Studies program. Um, and truly, my uh, the scholarship that, that I experienced, the academic rigor, it would have not been possible without that support. Um, and also, you know, being able to do research at the library and the archive where, where there's a lot of aligned collections like the Dorothy Arsner collection, um, you know, the Stanley Kramer collection, that kind of work um, is impossible anywhere else. So really proud to be here and, and to, to be part of this team. Um, I should mention the archives, um, Archive Research and Study Center has a home in the Powell Library and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, Carol Block, I see your question about uh, the Santa Clarita uh, facility. Um, so uh, nearly all of our moving image collections reside in the Packard Humanities Institute STOA. We're grateful to our partners and collaborators at the Packard Humanities Institute and to David Packard um, to call the STOA our home. Right now, it is not open to the public. Um, in fact, we've had um, closures on and off during the pandemic due to the fact that um, we're, you know, unfortunately uh, experienced when everyone else in this in this world is. Um, so we've been open um, roughly for half of the year um, on and off. Um, uh, we reopened more recently on March 1st with staff focusing on intake materials, access to the collections um, through our digital lab and preservation. Um, and working from home staff have been able to um, work on our virtual screening room project, um, transcription projects for better accessibility and cataloging. Um, you know, in terms of the future, we do hope to open up the space to the public, but right now, given health considerations and, and regulations, we're, we're really keeping it to staff only. And in fact, it's a limited staff. Um, so that we're able to get the work we can done safely. So uh, I hope to be able to, to give a better update to, to all of us in the future. So um, thank you for that question. Um, these have been difficult times for everyone, but the institutional changes and economic challenges have really kind of surfaced work for the archive. Uh, we've taken stock of our goals. We've, been good, we've begun integrating deeply with the library and we're building plans for the future. So today I'm gonna to share with you some grounding principles for, for that work and then also a little bit about the archive um, just to give you a peek inside, so to speak. So we're here in the present though. And so I just wanna mention in this moment of great shifts and changes, I wanna affirm the archive's deep commitment to equity diversity and inclusion. We value the voices in our communities, the collections we serve, the cultural producers among us, the researchers, the scholars. This work is really rooted in service and we do so, and we do so with the acknowledgement that as an archivist, we need to take time to question, listen, act, and transform. So part of this project is strategic work. We've identified, as I mentioned, key areas that are of service to the archive's mission. 
Um, first and foremost, uh, for many people uh, and most present is the service to the public. Through screenings, our website, and through social media, we engage with users from all over the world. Um, and then in the theater, from the best seat in your house um, and also the best seat at the house at the Billy Wilder Theater, we seek to engage um, all users. Our programming and online collection gives unique windows into history, filmmaking, and culture. We serve the past, present, and the future. It goes without saying um, that we also then serve uh, the, the past very more intentionally um, and the future. And so that's the work that we're really trying to do um, with, with some of our strategic plan. And I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, we're also in a race against time to save the film, television, and newsreel footage in our collections. It's time consuming work and technical and greatly rewarding. And um, I'll share more with you a little bit why. And finally, and not exclusively, we serve research and education, um, bringing moving images to the foreground as primary research material um, for study and for scholarship is, is at the key to uh, building a better future for the archives and for the field. Um, we're embarking on a period right now of building a robust digital infrastructure, which will make it possible for more students and classes to use archive materials that range from feature films to documentaries to national local TV news to 27 million feet of first newsreels. So now we're going to dive in a little bit deeper. So let me tell you a little bit about why archiving is important. Um, as many of you probably know, archiving is important, but, but nitrate uh, film is a, of a special concern to us. It's estimated that 50% of all films produced in the United States prior to 1950 have disappeared, and that potentially 90% of classic film prints in the United States are currently in very poor condition. Until, the, until 1950, films were produced using nitrate cellulose film stock, a chemically unstable and flammable material that eventually deteriorates and turns to dust. Nitrate can actually produce its own oxygen. So if you were to light a piece of nitrate um, on fire, which I've actually done, and you try to dunk it in water, it creates its own oxygen and keeps burning. That is how flammable it is. Um, so thanks to um, the Packard Humanities Institute, um, we're able to take this very, um, you know, chemically you know, unstable material and try to put it into our state of the art nitrate vaults there at the Packard Humanities Institute, um, Phi Stoa. So that's in Santa Clarita, um, nitrate is stored at very cold and dry conditions um, really to help uh, stop the deterioration that is, that is happening and ongoing. Some of our more famous major restorations from nitrate holdings include Becky Sharp, The Quiet Man, The Red Shoes, She Wore a Yellow Ribbon, and most recently Michael Curtiz's Dr. X, which was funded by the Film Foundation and recently released on Blu-ray via the Warner Archive Collection. We have the opportunity to create preservation elements and new, um, and new 35 millimeter film stock when we have that. Um, we can ensure these films will last several hundred more years in proper archival storage. So let's move to safety film. So um, in 1950, more stable acetate film stock or safety film was utilized in film production, but sadly it also deteriorates, um, giving rise to what we call in the industry vinegar syndrome and and or irreversible color fading. So as an example of this, um, you, you can see in a before and after still of Queens at Heart. So this has a, a deep kind of connection to me. Um, when I was at UCLA um, as a project manager, as an intern, um, the collector of this film who had actually found it, I think on eBay or through another collector, she had purchased this um, as part of a feature film for like $75 and she came into the archive and my colleagues were there and, and I, this was almost 20 years ago and she handed me a 35 millimeter can and said, this is important, you know, we need to preserve this essentially. And from that um, journeyed uh, a process where we, we found um, a woman who was very deeply connected to this film and, and supported the restoration um, in collaboration with um, Outfest, uh, a, deep, a partner we have around LGBTQ film, film preservation. 
and um, fundraising with members of Outfest, and we're able to preserve it and bring it back to life. Um, so without a doubt, these small motions, these small um, intentional things that we do in archiving have such a big impact and can reverberate um, across you know, communities. So this film is shown worldwide now, um, it's online. People are able to access something that, that represents pre-Stonewall queer community in New York, which is to me, frankly, just amazing. So um, I'm gonna move on to our digital restoration efforts. Um, for the majority of the archive's 50 years, we've been preserving and utilizing photochemical laboratory techniques to create new film elements directly from film sources. Um, in addition to being prohibitively expensive, um, it's really labor-intensive um, photochemical, this labor-intensive photochemical workflow still embeds damaged and worn film sources and anomalies in, um, printed through in the process. So digital restoration tools are able to help um, clean that work up. So um, with this example um, from our recent restoration of Warner Brothers title, Mystery, Mystery of the Wax Museum, you see an example of um, extensive damage on this two-color Technicolor nitrate print that was basically the only source for our restoration. Um, thanks to advanced digital technologies, we now have the tools to go in and fix this um, frame by frame. Um, the Mystery of the Wax Museum Restoration was funded by the Film Foundation and the Hobson Lucas Film Family Foundation is also available on Blu-ray um, with commentary for the archives preservation team as well as Alan Rohde from the Film Noir Foundation. So look at that. I mean, just tremendous. So while the archive is fortunate to receive funding to facilitate just a few high-end projects, um, uh, you know, we are uh, with with collaborations with uh, folks like the Film Foundation, Film Noir Foundation, Packard Humanities Institute, smaller foundations and individual donors help us preserve um, the many smaller orphan films like the examples you see here. Um, we're working on Leslie Harris's 1992 film, Just Another Girl on the RIRT in, um, in partnership with the Academy and the Sundance Institute. Um, we're also um, wrapping up on the restoration of the, the 3D noir classic, I, the Jury, thanks to Connie Elliott. Um, so these are some other examples that we're working on. Um, and I'm just going to now shift from why restoration is important and why, we're, why this work is really key to, to our cultural memory and talk a little bit about what the archive, what's specific to UCLA that we, that we do that's really important. So we're going to dip into collections a little bit. Um, the scope of the archives collections date back to the early examples of, the, of film in the late 19, 1890s. They cover the birth of broadcasting in the late 1940s and extend all the way to contemporary independent cinema. Each film and tape in the archives conservation vaults have a story to tell. As archivists, curators, and educators, our goals are to collect, preserve, and share the entire spectrum of histories that fully reflect and embrace the diverse world we live in. So embedded in every frame of every work is a snapshot of our collective cultural history. Our goals and responsibilities in collecting are to ensure that as many frames as possible survive, to be seen and studied and to lead and assist in bringing everyone's stories to the foreground to be told. Service, as I've mentioned, is, is really a core um, at the core of all that we do. Service to UCLA, to academia, and to the general public. A film sitting on a vault shelf doesn't come to life until it is seen. When films are preserved and brought to out of obscurity through our access initiatives, good things happen. New histories are written and previously undertold under stories and diverse perspectives become known. With over 500,000 physical holdings, the UCLA Film and Television Archive is the second moving, largest moving image archive, as Susan mentioned, um, in the United States next to the Library of Congress. Half a million is a big number, but what does it really represent? Contained in our collections are historic newsreels, independent and local and, and, local and community-based works, classic Hollywood studio libraries, and decades of local and network television entertainment and news programming. 
In the next few slides, I'm going to share a few br brief clips of films that we've preserved, of works that we've preserved in the archive, and so that I can help illuminate how impactful these collections and stories can be. But let's start with our newsreel collection. UCLA's Hearst Newsreel Collection encompasses 27 million feet of film. Donated with copyright to UCLA in 1981, the collection includes distributed newsreels produced from 1919 through 1967, as well as Hearst's telenews, TV news footage, and significant coverage of the civil rights movement. Now we're going to screen an iconic Hearst newsreel from, the 1930, from 1939 featuring Marian Anderson. The historic setting of this concert was required when Anderson was barred from performing at Constitutional Hall, which would have allowed, which did not allow black performers. Please note that the sound quality is the best we have available at this time. So if you can start that video. <laughs> nation's most impressive Easter demonstration, 75,000 mass before Lincoln Memorial to hear Marian Anderson, colored contralto, make her capital debut at the Great Emancipator Shrine. Refusal of the DAR to let her use their hall fanned a countrywide controversy with this great gathering as the climax. The singer was invited by Secretary of the Interior, Ickes, who attends with Secretary of the Treasury, Morgenthau. Spectators include Supreme Court Justice Black, New York Senator Robert Wagner, and a host of notables, here to listen to the voice acclaimed by many as the finest in a century. You might notice that the music in that background was a minstrel song, Camptown Racing, which unfortunately was kind of reflective of the time and, and how, how that newsreel um, was presented. But if we pull back and look at the context and content of this historic clip, um, I, I imagine the limitations of media during these times and the incredible significance to the event and documentation is so important. Um, so we're proud to work alongside our partners at the Packard Humanities Institute to help um, preserve these newsreels and to make them accessible for students, scholars, aficionados um, to, to see history and, and to be in a time machine really and, and look back on these and, and see what was going on in the world and how stories were shared. So uh, the motion picture collection represents approximately 160,000 unique titles. Examples from the collection range from landmarks in cinema history, such as Harold Lloyd's Safety Last, to half a dozen films by the groundbreaking um, filmmaker Dorothy Arzner, whose papers are also housed at the library's special collections, to pioneering films such as Jenny Livingston's Paris is Burning and Julie Dash's Daughters of the Dust. We're gonna move to talk about television, which is a huge part of the collection. Um, our collection represents um, 132,000 unique titles with another 100,000 programs in our off-air news and public affairs collection. Um, included in the TV collection are rare network dramatic anthologies from the golden age of television. For example, we're preserving um, something from Playhouse 90 right now, um, a pilot episode of that. Um, uh, we preserved uh, the first episode or the pilot episode of All in the Family. Um, we're working on a Rod Serling program coming up, um, and we have thousands of, of news holdings as well, including rare footage donated from, with copyright from historic local station KTLA. So in this KTLA clip from 1971, actor George Dekai and a survivor of the devastation at Nagasaki denounced U.S. government plans to conduct nuclear testing in the Aleutian Islands. 
So it's a bit of a hard clip to watch, but I hope I hope it'll connect with you as it did to me. Mr. Takai, in view of the fact that the president has decided to go ahead with this bomb blast, what do you hope to accomplish? I myself lost an aunt. We have some here who are survivors of the uh, bombing at Nagasaki and Hiroshima. We feel very deeply and very personally the, the, the horror of the use of this bomb. Why test it if it's not going to be used? And the, if it is going to be, uh, it, and, and that idea is absolutely inconceivable to us. Mrs. Pavatel, I understand that you're a survivor of the Nagasaki bomb blast. Tell me, why are you opposed to this particular blast in the Aleutian Islands? Uh, because I'm a mother of a three, uh, three children. I want when the, the, my children uh, grown up have the, the nice home instead of all polluted. And uh, uh, if we keep using uh, testing, there's no place for us to uh, live and uh, safely. Does your husband share your views in this? Yes, he does. How about your children? What do they say to you? Are they concerned about this as well? Oh, yes. They are uh, pretty strong about it. And uh, I, every so often, I tell, uh, tell them about my experience. And uh, even then, even I uh, tell them they uh, still no one can really feel what I feel. But uh, I think uh, they, uh, everybody have to take my word, too, from uh, survivors. That's the way I feel. So what I love about this clip, um, it's a unique snapshot in, in a moment in you know, community activism here in Los Angeles uh, is so many things. I mean, you know, what she says about no one can feel what I feel, I mean, that is the human experience. But what we're trying to do is to share moving images and to make them accessible, to allow folks to understand other people's journeys um, through our collections. And that's really the root of our work. Um, imagine a student interested in Star Trek or George Takai um, for his role in gay rights or you know, just scrolling through this collection and finding something that really reverberates in a different way. And I think that's what really connects me to this clip and a lot of, a lot of what we have in our collection. So um, we provide tools for discovery of history through the collection. I wanna shift now to access. This is something that is the core of my work and something I'm so passionate about. Um, the, our, the Film and Television Art, Film and Television Archives Research and Study Center it is the primary access point to the archives collection for the UCLA community and broad constituency of faculty, scholars, students, and professionals from around the world. Located in Powell Library, the Research and Study Center um, and the staff is charged with engaging in continuous outreach efforts both at UCLA and at events local and beyond to introduce researchers to the archives catalog and to work directly with faculty and students on developing approaches to utilizing the collection for many different research topics across so many disciplines. So um, next slide, in, in 2018, my colleague Mark Quigley actually received a request when he was there um, at the Archive Research and Study Center. He's now the television archivist. Um, and he received a request from somebody asking about a UCLA student film titled, We're Alive. It was a 1974 documentary produced collaboratively with a group of women prisoners um, uh, in Chino, actually locally, and the UCLA Women's Film Workshop, which we actually don't have a lot of information about. And so these two groups came together, women prisoners, and uh, women filmmakers to make a uh, documentary about the prisoner's experience. Um, the scholar, a postdoctoral researcher from Canada was writing an article about women's prison films and really couldn't locate any copy. And so we searched our archive high and low for the title and other archives and we eventually located, strangely enough, two 16 millimeter prints in Britain. Um, at the British Film Institute. And so working with them, uh, we brought the films over to the archive, scanned and preserved them. And um, let's watch a clip now um, and see this. I think this portion was recorded, uh, was filmed on, was, was taped on video. And so um, there's, 
video and film sort of uh, issues going on here, but hopefully you can see sort of the, the interesting story that they filmed. I was totally ignorant of politics, uh, what the United States consists of. I was so into me, you know, in a big self-pity trip that I never really looked around to see the rest of the world, you know, and that the whole world is in the same bag that I'm in. But now I know the reasons that created it, and I can correct it. But I think the majority of the people really aren't aware of why they're doing what they're doing or why they're suffering, you know, in the way that they're suffering. And the knowledge has to be given. You know, people just have to be, become more concerned with people. Maybe somebody looking at this, you know, sometime will, will be able to learn that um, we're no different from them, you know, and that our problems are their problems, you know, and that any one of those people could be in my position right now. The main, the main thing is unity. I know within a prison setting, the unity is much stronger because you're all in the same spot and you know you are. When you're in the free world, it seems to be a little bit more selfish. The people just don't seem to care that much for other people. You know, and so I really wonder who's really in prison. You know, is it really us? And uh, it all boils down to concern. You know, the whole the whole country has to be concerned for each other. We can't place nobody above or below. You know, when you reach a hand out, you don't look at the hand first. You know, to see what kind of hand it is. You just grab a hold of it and pull them up. So after locating the film and preserving it, um, a year later, we were able to share it with the scholar who visited Los Angeles um, to do her research at the Archive Research and Study Center. And it's this sort of life cycle of um, stewardship, not just around um, our collections, but around how scholars connect with our work. That's really at the root of what we do. It's really important. Um, and this kind of passion, what is it? How is it important? let's find it, let's preserve it, is um, something that is, is deeply affecting and, and important. So just wanted to share that film with you as well um, and talk a little bit also about how we collaborate within UCLA. So um, the archive contributes to UCLA's mission of academic excellence through innovative and interdisciplinary campus collaborations. Um, the School of Theater, Film, and Television historically has been one of our primary um, academic departments that we engage with. Um, and we're currently collaborating with the Cinema Media Studies program there um, on the Getty Foundation's Pacific Standard Time Science and Art Grant. Um, and, and that'll be coming up um, for a project entitled Science Fiction Against the Margins. The archive is also working closely with the Department of Information Studies, Library and Information Science Program, specifically Media Archive Studies track. I taught a course um, last fall um, around media description and access. Um, that's a strong relationship and we want to deepen that. Um, and we're also doing classroom presentations and overseeing student interns and student mentorships. mentorships. The archive regularly also works with library divisions and affiliate libraries, such as the Chacano Studies Research Center and Library Special Collections, building synergy between moving image, paper, and photographic holdings and introducing students, faculty, and researchers to the breadth of unique primary sources available across campus collections. So the impact of our outreach efforts on public discourse around collection materials is well represented in our hosting of research-based symposia, which includes curated screenings and guest speakers. For example, we've co-hosted the Orphan Film Symposium in collaboration with the New York, with New York University, presenting, presented a program called This is the City, um, which was uh, around preserving moving images in Los Angeles. Um, and just before the pandemic, we presented 40 years institutional history of the university that included the participation of so many alumni, including uh, Nina Menkes, Todd Holland, and Nancy Richardson. One of the archive's most powerful points of impact is the publication of scholarship garnered from our collection. Every year, scholars visit the Research and Study Center, um, often visiting multiple times over multiple years 
to produce books and articles that offer invaluable contributions to the field of media culture and archival studies. These authors become a part of the archive's vibrant network, and we end up collaborating with many of them on public program series, guest lectures, blog posts, and preservation projects. So we see the Archive and Research Study Centers really being kind of a nexus of the intersection between um, scholarship and dissemination. The archive is really just so proud of this work where we not only demonstrate the kind of rigorous and creative inte intellectual discourse taking place at UCLA, but it really exemplifies the archive's guiding principles to serve academia and the general public through access and, ex and to explore a collection. I might sneeze, so I apologize if that happens. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the most visible examples of our work includes our screenings. During the pandemic, we've had a tremendous platform in the virtual screening room. Thus far, we've uh, shown dozens of programs almost weekly since last summer. Um, over 10,000 visitors have watched and growing from as far as Macedonia, Cuba, Korea, and of course, here in Los Angeles. Um, I'd love to give you a preview of an ongoing um, of uh, an ongoing series, um, including um, really just highlighting um, something that we are excited to show: um, the work of legendary television producer Barbara Schultz, one of the very few women who rose through the executive ranks in the late 1960s and 1970s. Um, we'll screen two episodes from our landmark PBS series, Visions. First, uh, The War Widow, a 1977 drama that sensitively explored romantic love between two women. And the second will be Gold Watch, which was produced in 1976 and written by Momoko Iko. Um, that drama explores the impact of the unjust Japanese incarceration, Japanese American incarceration during World War II. Um, we recently actually showed a, a really popular program, um, uh, which was uh, Maya Angelou's um, The Tapestry, which was a, which was a part of Visions, um, and that was presented with um, Ellen Scott from the School of Theater, Film, and Television, um, you know, talking about the film. So we love collaborating across UCLA, outside of UCLA, and there's so many tremendous, you know, scholars and researchers here who really um, deep in our collections and access to them. Um, you can catch these programs and more um, at the link in a chat that I'll paste um, shortly. Um, and really excited about seeing you all um, in the movies and also at the virtual screening room. So I think now we might have time for questions. I'm sorry, Susan, I went a little over my 25 minutes, but hopefully we can uh, we can talk about what I what I shared and um, answer anything that I can help um, with the group. So really excited to be here. Thank you. It was wonderful what you had to say and what you had you showed. The moving images are so powerful. Um, I couldn't get over hearing Marian Anderson and um, the fact that it has been preserved so well. And thanks to UCLA for that, as well as making everything access accessible. So please, uh, anyone who has some questions, please submit them. In the meantime, I'm going to ask May some questions that we've been talking about. We talked about a little bit yesterday. Um, let's see. You and before I forget, I'm going to just paste the virtual screening room link in here. Sorry for a little promotion. We want everyone to be able to join us there. Um, so okay. if folks okay. want to go there, they yeah. can. Um, so um, uh, Susan, whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, so you were at UCLA, then you left. What things have surprised you uh, coming back as a leader in a leadership role and the powerful uh, position that you have in educating and providing access to what this archive is. Um, thank you. So uh, one of the things that that I've really found both exciting and also powerful has been, and, and I'm really saying this because it's true, not because of the group we're, I'm speaking with, but it's actually the um, leadership within the the institution that is is very women focused and centered. Um, so I I left an institution that you know 
didn't have as much diversity in that respect. I was the only manager and senior manager um, uh, at my level who was a woman. Um, the only person who was a woman of color um, in that position within the film archive. Um, and the archival field is, is changing, but um, it's slowly changing. Um, and so to join UCLA, to have a boss who's a, a fierce, strong and sharp woman, to have uh, direct reports who are managers who are women um, is really amazing to me. Um, and, and I really appreciate the, that kind of leadership style. Um, of course, you know, I, I work within the world that we live in um, and and work with all types of folks, but it's enjoyable to at least see the field changing um, through the lens of this position and through, frankly, you know, the, the folks I get to work with um, directly. So that's that's exciting um, and, and different for me, too. You know, yeah. um, I'm, I'm used to I was used to working with colleagues mostly um, who were um, at my level or, or higher who were who were men um, and um, though they were wonderful and and helped mentor me um, it's it's a definitely a great experience in this space too so. so what are you most excited about the future for the archives well so I mentioned equity diversity and inclusion is something yeah. I'm interested in um, you know, also the the films collect the collections of, of the archive are also very much industry and Hollywood based. And coming from the Academy, we have the Oscars. You know, um, I am somebody who's who's a lover of Hollywood film and um, classics, but also um, independent, experimental LGBTQ film. My my ra my range is pretty wide, but it's actually not about me. It's about the archive, right? Um, so what I want to do is to find ways that we can take equity, diversity, and inclusion and bake it into the archives process. And truly the staff have been so committed to this already. It actually makes it easy, um, but I'd like to do more around that. Um, collecting um, more collections by, by people of color, by queer folks, by marginalized um, individuals, um, building better accessibility so that um, folks can really um, watch our films online and see close captioning. Um, you know, this particular pandemic has really surfaced um, a lot of the issues around accessibility that that I think we should have been thinking about and is forcing us to. So I'm excited for all of that. Um, uh, really also just getting back into the theater. <laughs> um, one of our film programmers um, said yesterday she went to a movie and it was, you know, I think she was the only person in the theater. It was something, you know, in, in North Hollywood. We're not, our theater isn't open yet and, and we're working on that. Um, but, uh, you know, our theater, meaning the Billy Wilder Theater, which is, a, which is at the Hammer Museum. But um, I would say that she said something about crying when she went in and sat and watched a movie. And one of the things that we've done is taken surveys of uh, the people who attend our virtual screening room. And a lot of people are watching films alone, which is to me a really interesting data point, right? So there's something about seeing a movie alone in a theater with 10 other people. There's something about seeing a movie alone in you know, your living room, in your pajamas. And I, and both are great, but I'd love to get folks back in the theater um, to enjoy um, cinema on the big screen. So those are, that's my long-winded answer, sorry. <laughs> I'm excited okay. about a lot of things. It's okay. It, yeah. It's um, the excitement besides having popcorn, right? <laughs> I would love a bucket of popcorn too. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, besides the pandemic, what's the biggest challenge in the short term that you see for the archives and then the long term? So the archive has some work to do around building our a robust digital infrastructure. Um, we received um, you know, funding from um, uh, the John H. Mitchell estate. Um, and um, through that, we were able to to you know, shore up some of the work around television preservation, really focusing on television, of course, given his history and legacy. Um, but then also um, 
using some of that as directed, which is to build uh, a media asset management system. And we build a media asset management system. You know, if you've got all these files, all these, um, all these different codecs and formats and everything, it's really important for accessibility to be able to manage it. And so we are working on that. That is a short term um, challenge because it's, you know, expensive, it's complex. It requires us to work, you know, inter and intra departmentally to ensure that this tool is used not just by the archive, but by the library. Um, it's financially and, and fiscally challenging because of, of just how, uh, you know, you buy, you, you get high speed storage and then you need a transcoder to convert the files and then you need a digital archivist who's gonna help with data governance and, you know, all of these complexities um, that build a better future for digital access are, are at, at our um, shore right now. And we're, we're really trying to, to wade that. Um, and then long-term, once we have that, um, you know, collecting more digital, digitally born collections, scanning, preserving things, and providing access to them, though we are still dedicated to photochemical preservation, of course, is a challenge. You know, we want to build it so that we have a tool. So when I talk to filmmakers who are working on important documentaries and they have interviews they want to place with us or oral histories or the latest, you know, you know, you know, classic Hollywood film we'd like to restore with a studio and we want to, to save those files, we need that. Um, so the long term is is kind of embedded in the short term, but then the outreach to bring folks in requires that. Um, and so we have to have kind of this foundational approach and then build on that so that folks can trust us and know that we will take care of their physical and digital assets um, as they are our own. So that is, that is important to me. So I know you went to an all women's college as I did. Can you share more? about this experience and how it informed your perspective on leadership and women working together. You mentioned it a little bit earlier, but. Right, I mean, this is so important to me. I think, so I have to say, I, UCLA was on my radar for undergrad, but it was 30 miles from my very strict parents. And so I tried to get as far away from them as possible. <laughs> I love, love them very much. Um, but uh, it was actually really helpful for me. I think any college or university that allows somebody to grow in the way they're meant to um, is important. So in that respect, it allowed me to see women in leadership roles and see myself not as a, you know, bossy young teenager who had ideas and wanted to do stuff, but as somebody who had potential. Um, and actually, I think that's what UCLA provided when I went there as a graduate student is, you know, I had these questions like what happens to these films after they're seen at a festival, you know, after they're shown, um, you know, uh, you know, in the movie theater, after you see them on television, what happens? Asking those questions and having answers um, through UCLA was, was important to my growth. But foundationally being able to see myself as potentially somebody who could who could ask questions and it was okay to ask questions and it was okay to make mistakes and it was okay to see other women not as um you know uh as as anything but allies right so uh that was a mind shift for me um that was important so we have questions from the audience. I'm going to get to them. I don't need to ask all of ours. So when do you anticipate that live screening of films and television preserved by the archive will resume on campus? And how can we find out the schedule? <laughs> That's a great question. So we're working on that. Um, you know, we've had a, a really wonderful home at the, at the Billy Wilder Theater with, in, with the Hammer Museum. Um, and we want to continue that. Um, and so that is uh, in progress. Um, we're working towards that. Um, and I have to say, you know, I can't say much around it now, but when it's announced, we'll be sure it's on our website and social media. Um, you know, the challenge of, of any theater of a size that's about 280 
290 is that you know if you spread it out so that there's enough space um, there aren't actually a lot of seats that are available right and so we're trying to think about the best approach so that we can have as many people there um, that makes it possible so screening a film and call includes you know a rental includes um booking a print hopefully it's our own print um paying the rights holder um potentially bringing in a guest and so that's actually something that you know we have to think about just whether or not it makes uh when it makes the most sense and how we can so the long-winded way of saying this is definitely one of my priorities and something that for me is so important i grew up going to the movie theater. Like I grew up in Orange County and I didn't have as many friends as I probably should have. And I would drive to the, U, I think it was like the UC Irvine, the university village where they played all the avant-garde and not avant-garde, more like, you know, foreign titles and independent titles. And I just plop myself down and watch a movie. And I know how impactful that is to me. I think it's impactful to other folks. We want to make that happen. So. You will find well, out and hopefully, hopefully we'll have something um, in the next few months. We probably aren't going to move good. faster than that. We'll be watching. Yeah. So Thank are you. you doing, someone else has, are you doing any work with the new Academy Museum? Yes, actually. Um, we are working. I mean, I, I actually helped, um, I wouldn't say curate, but put together a lot of what was um, going to be in the, um, the Oscars gallery um, because that was a specific type of specialty that I had, which is Oscar history. Um, and so um, that was my in my past iteration. But now we're we're talking to the Academy Museum about um, and the Academy about continued collaborations on preservation projects. So the museum, I won't I don't want to speak for them, but I do know they're committed to um, preservation and also access to materials. Um, with the film archive there, that's a strong relationship, the Academy Film Archive and Museum, and UCLA has a really strong relationship there as well. Um, the uh, head of programming, Bernardo Rondeau, is actually, um, uh, he's actually a UCLA alum, um, and he and I took classes together. Uh, we have a strong relationship. Amy Homa there, who's um, Director of Education, Jacqueline Stewart, I know all of them, and we're all excited to continue working together. We, we've spoken pretty recently. So oh, um, without helped. previewing what we're doing, it's something that we all want to do. So how is it determined which items will be selected for refurbishing or preservation, besides the availability of money? Well, I added that. <laughs> it's a great question. Um, condition, um, really we want to focus on what is actually deteriorating and how, how much intervention needs to be done. So for example, we have a project where um, the nitrate has, has unfortunately, despite cold and dry conditions, it's continuing to deteriorate at a level we have to go in and make um, preservation elements for. Um, that's one component curatorially if it fits our mission. So we are working on, you know, classic Hollywood titles um, to some extent, to some extent golden age of, of television, but also films that might, um, for example, have a, an important UCLA connection like the film We're Alive or uh, films that meet our sort of um, goals around uh, surfacing diverse works, right? So. Um, it's really a combination of things. It's hard to make that decision just solely on one criteria, but we really try to look at it from a holistic standpoint. What is the condition? What are the relationships? Can we do it? Um, so I don't know if that fully answers the question. Sometimes you see a title and you just know we have to work on that. It's really important. No one else is going to. Like that women's, uh, the UCLA film, women's film workshop, no one was, BFI was not going to preserve that because that's probably not within their mission, right? And so we had to step in and do that work. And that's where we see uh, an important role for us is, is to find those gaps in history and in preservation work and make sure that we take care of that and then also drive the field by doing, you know, world-class restoration. So going back to thinking about getting your master's degree from UCLA, it was in moving image archive studies, which is a specialty. I had to underline it to remember to get all the 
adjectives. So how did that help you with your job and then your career selections as well as decisions of where to go next? I, I, I was asking these questions as a film programmer because um, I was showing and watching a lot of independent queer films and I was wondering to myself what happens to these films when they're shown afterwards, right? And this was in pre-digital age. So they'd be 16 prints, 35 prints of video um, and uh, videotape rather. And, um, and I took that question and I decided I would apply. Um, UCLA was an obvious choice for me. Um, it's a niche field, but one that's just so important because you know we hold a lot of the legacy of, of, of our cultural memory in terms of moving images. Um, so I, I essentially landed on UCLA because of the fellowship, which I referred to earlier, because of the support I had. Um, and there I found a wonderful community of you know folks in the theater, film, and television um, school within the, um, now it's the Education Information Studies Department, um, within the archive that I felt really held and uplifted to, to learn, to make mistakes, to grow. Um, that program, though it is no longer, um, has transitioned into kind of more of a media archival studies track um, through the Education Information Studies Department. Um, but the through line of UCLA um, in this field, in, in media archaeology and film restoration and archival studies is still really strong. Um, and so that's something that we want to do more of. We are working towards um, trying to bring in more work study students and internships um, with support so that students can just learn from our expertise and we can also probably learn a little from them. Um, I was looking at our stats of how many of our staff were former interns and there's at least six of them and we have a staff of 30. Um, and some are department managers and some are you know, working within, within departments as well. And um, I wanna see those numbers change. I'd love to be able to work closely around having students engage with archival material. Um, when I taught the class that I mentioned last fall, I noticed that students didn't have the same kind of understanding of media um, information, literacy, media archival studies, any of that um, at, when, I, when I joined. Um, so things like this is a 35 millimeter print and you have changeover projection and you have, you know, this is what, um, you know, how Technicolor film was shot. Folks didn't really, don't really understand that anymore. Um, and, and when you went into graduate school 20 years ago, you might have known right? A little bit of that. So I do see a hand raised, but I will say that's something that really is, I feel really strongly about um, building up eventually is, is yeah. having deeper um, archival understanding in, in graduate students and, and undergrad as well. Interesting, right. So how is the, here's another question, how's the recent proliferation of media and sources of visual images impacted the archives goals. It's kind of addressing what you were talking about. Times have changed so much and the collection processes. Right, so we have to have a strong digital infrastructure to be able to take in anything that is, um, you know, a, a dig digitally born asset. Um, so we're working to do that. Um, and it's changed our minds because it, it has to, you have to think really strongly about how you're curating the collection. You can't just take everything in. Um, that would not be a good role for an archive. You can't preserve everything. You can't save everything. But what you can do is focus your mission. So what we're having to do is actually we're doing this not right now, but it started, which is looking at what our collection policies are and reframing them to consider digital access and digital items. Um, and then eventually, you know, really doing the outreach efforts to, to build our collection in those areas. Um, so I do see a hand up. I think Vicki's hand is up. Um, yeah. We asked them to, to, to put it in the chat. Could you put it in the chat, someone? Well, I'm sorry, I had to leave. My, my only question was, oh. are, can you unmute me? Am I unmuted? Yes. Oh, we hear you. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I had to miss some of this, but my question was, 
are you converting to 4K digital or 8K, you know, the latest digital? Um, right now we have we have a 4K scanner um, at the archive. We are thinking about um, potentially a higher resolution. Um, uh, that does have data implications for in terms of like, you know, the bandwidth of what the archive can handle. If we're, right. if we're scanning at 8K, it's going to affect just our, you know, um, our storage capacities um, and bandwidth. So, you know, moving files even will be even more difficult at 8K than 4K. Um, 4K, I feel like is probably good enough, particularly for 16 millimeter film. Some would argue 2K is fine for 16. For 35, depending on the picture, depending on the title, um, I think 4K is, is suitable. And a lot of the vendors we still work with when we work outside of our own digital lab where our 4K scanner is, um, oftentimes are really still focusing on 4K right now. So I think that is, is thankfully we're, we're part of that movement towards that. Um, um, so we're thinking bigger but I don't want to make those choices until I know, you know, what the full financial and um, infrastructure impact that has on the archive in terms of that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So have you got, because obviously they're going to be improving. There's going to be another, you know, 12K someday or something. Who knows? But um, did you go back and convert to 4K the older ones, are you in the process of doing that? Do you need help to do that? Well, um, thank you so much for your question. Um, so it depends on the on the on the element, you know, and so our preservationists and our curators are really able, their expertise is to look at something and say, is this, you know, worthy of either re-restoring -rest again, scanning again, um, working on this title again. As archivists, you're kind of only there for, if you're doing a good job, you're, you're there for a portion of the lifespan of a moving image. And so another archivist or, or yourself will, mm -hmm. will shift that material for the future, right? So um, I imagine some of those choices will need to be made. We're not making them immediately. Um, a lot of our operational goals and needs are, are focused on kind of the backlog also of, of work that took place that should have taken place during the pandemic. Um, we are up particularly with standard definition video, but not necessarily to 4K. It's just not necessary. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's in terms of help needing it, it's, it's something that um, I'd really defer to our preservationists to focus on um, whether or not that's worth it. Thank you. And thank you. A big thank you. This has been so extraordinary, May. Um, first of all, for creating time in your schedule to present all of this material, for bringing tears to many of us with some of those wonderful historic things. And it's really wonderful to know what UCLA is doing with the film and television archives. I also want to say thank you to our events uh, behind the scenes staff whose faces we couldn't see earlier, Stella Plateau, Melissa Delgadillo, and Eduardo Ponte of the development events team. Uh, we're working on our final program for the academic year, as Melissa mentioned, and we may have something. Thank you again to Melissa and Betty who continue to introduce us to more of UCLA's wonders. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you all.